Thank you very much. And thanks a lot to Sujay Samir for inviting me. And it's been a really great week. And so I hope you will survive yet another session this morning. Uh, this talk is, um, is very much a um, continuation of Roberto's talk, but I will also touch upon things that Suresh was talking about uh, this morning. So this is based on work with uh, Matthias Roberto and Henrik Ronell and Fitch. Uh, and well, it seems that um, for every paper, one of the authors drop out. <laughs> so for the next meeting, we'll see if it's you know, Roberto or me or Maybe someone else will join. I don't know. <laughs> We're just destroying one author after the other. <laughs> um, so I want to start by just stealing Jeff's picture uh, <laughs> because I thought it was so nice. Just to give um, it's a little bit of a, a general picture uh, of the whole story and one aspect that hasn't been emphasized so much. So in the monster story, the whole starting point was if you recall, the J function and the, the connection with the monster group, which was explained by the fact that there existed VUA, bosonic string theory, which had the monster as its automorphism group. Now, this, this J function is the gradient dimension. And so this explanation was given by Frankie Lepowski and Merman. Uh, but in fact, to actually prove all of the Conway Norton conjectures, uh, Borchich needed something more. You needed a, a Lie algebra, the so-called monster Lie algebra, so that was a borchardt katz moody algebra, that could be constructed from a certain, taking a certain BRST cohomology from this, and you get a Lie algebra that inherits the monster action. And he showed that you know, this Lie algebra has a denominator formula, which is given by the product formula of the J function. And, and this, this whole sort of circle of ideas has definitely not been realized in the context of Mathieu Moonshine, but somehow we have the, this new M24 Moonshine, and for me this is great because I was always very intrigued by the monstrous Moonshine, but you know, I wasn't born at that time, at least scientifically, so this, this gives me some, um, some chance to, to join the, the Moonshine uh, crowd. Um, so let me just summarize a little bit, some, compare the two. Uh, thing. So for the monster, we have the monster group. We know that this is the associated group seems to be M24, A.B. Conway. Uh, here you have bosonic CFT. Here it seems to be some super conformal field theory. Uh, the Virasora algebra in the monstrous moonshine corresponds to an n equal to 4 super Virasora algebra. The J function seems to be related to the elliptic genus of K3. And the McKay-Thompson series are some associated twining genera, some weak Jacobi forms, or you can also formulate it in terms of mock modular forms. But there are these two big question marks. We don't know what is the analog of the monster module, and we also have no clue what is the analog of the monster Lie algebra. So I think either of these two, filling in either of these two blanks would be very gratifying, and, and probably they will be related. And so part of the motivation for what we do here is also try to connect a little bit to, to this the algebra structure and also to this algebra of BPS states uh, of Jeff and Greg. Um, so that's just to set the stage. So the big question is this, what does M24 act on? And, and the whole program that we've been working on is, 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 is aimed at you know, generalizing the first vanilla Mathieu Moonshine and see if that can shed some light on the whole question. So we have kind of a two-step generalization. First we consider it's generalized Mathieu Moonshine that Roberto was talking about. So Roberto's talk touched upon these things. And we also have another that we call second quantized Mathieu Moonshine. Um, so my talk will be uh, basically focusing on this, but I will also review a little bit about generalized Mathieu Moonshine that we need. Can I ask uh, yep. just one more general philosophy? So yes. Mm -hmm. After FLM was understood in terms of the whole continuum dimension property. Right. Is there any known algebraic structure that has M24 as its not, not as far as I know. I don't think there's any analog of the Gris algebra known. So that's. Um, 
I mean, this, there are these BKMs that Suresh was talking about, but somehow, you know, showing that one of them has an automorphism group is very hard. And, and so that is a good question. I mean, that would be a nice thing to have as a first, first approximation. Yeah. Um, okay, so the plan of this talk is to first do a little bit of a recap. I wasn't quite sure how far Roberto would go, so I will, but I think it is probably won't hurt to, to hear some of these things again. Then I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, second quantization and black hole counting in, in, in string theory. And then I will try to connect that. Inspired by this, I will introduce this uh, second quantized version of Mathieu Moonshine. And I also want to end with stressing that there seems to be a certain overlap between generalized material moonshine and umbral moonshine that is really not understood, but it points to some interesting uh, connection. And I will end with some summary and a bit of an, some open questions. Uh, okay, so generalized material moonshine, uh, Roberto explained that the main idea is to think of a pair for each pair of of commuting elements of M24, we would associate uh, a function like this, such that when you restrict to the identity, you recover the twining genera that are known. Now, this is very much in direct analogy with what Norton did. So Norton proposed shortly after the Conway-Norton conjecture that there should be some uh, generalization uh, associated with commuting pairs of elements of, of the monster such that if you restrict to the identity, you get the McKay-Thompson series. Now, in fact, very shortly after Norton's proposal, Jeff and friends said that, okay, this is partially explained by orbifolds of the FLM BOA. And this is, in fact, still open. Generalized monstrous moonshine is still an open conjecture, although in many special cases it has been proven. And, in fact, Scott Carnahan got this as a PhD um, problem from Borchardt's, and he is now well on his way to, to proving it, but it's still not been done. But the question we want to ask is, can we interpret this in terms of orbifolds? Well, the main assumption, this is we don't have a CFT, but we assume that the twisted twining genera behave similarly as for characters of a holomorphic orbifold. Now, we then use this fact that is, is not well known, at least I wasn't aware of this before we started this, this whole thing, but um, consistent holomorphic orbifolds are classified by the third cohomology uh, of the finite group, the automorphism group of the CFT. So there are some things that Roberto said that I will use, so I will review a little bit of the things I need. First of all, this means that the multiplier phases of the characters are determined by a two co-cycle representing a class in the second cohomology of the centralizer of the element G. And these are obtained from a class in the third cohomology via this sort of complicated formula. And so there are some interesting features of this. So, so if for instance, for the S and the T transformations, you have very explicit uh, description of the phases in terms of this two co-cycle. Under conjugation, so in general, the, the, the McKay-Thompson series, they are class functions. So that means that they only feel the, the, the conjugacy class. So if you conjugate by an element, then it remains the same. In general, this is not quite true. You do conjugation on these twisted twining objects. You pick up some face. And, and this has an interesting consequence. Because if you take the special situation where K commutes with both G and H, well, then you find a situation like this, where ZGH is equal to ZGH up to a face. And that means that unless this is zero, well, so this means that this, this twisted twining function must be zero unless the two co-cycle is symmetric in its argument or regular. So unless this is true, this thing must vanish. So there are certain cohomological obstructions to the existence of these functions. So this was pointed out Yes, first to us by Gannon. I'm not sure who, who said this first. Um, so, taking the, all this structure, we made this uh, educated guess or conjecture that for each element of M24, there should exist a unitary representation of the N1 of N equal to 4, 
uh, with central charge 6, which carries a projective representation of the centralizer of G in M24, commutes with N equal to 4, and it's determined by a certain class in H3. And moreover, there should be all these functions. So Roberto already listed the properties that they should restrict to the twining genera. They should be class function up to a phase. They are permuted under SL2Z, so they form a representation of the modular group with some phases. They decompose, they should decompose into characters of n equal to 4 um, with, with projective representations of the centralizer appearing here. And all the phases should be determined by a certain class in H3. So this was sort of the, the conjecture. And um, let me just give one example of, of uh, what we found. So for example, there, there is, um, you can take elements of order 8 and, and, uh, and 2 in, in class A and, and B, and you get a function like this. Turns out that this function satisfies all the properties. And um, it's a weak Jacobi form of weight 0 index 1 for this subgroup gamma 0, 4. And what you can do is you can then take then G and H and you can use the co-cycle that we have constructed to find that the phase should be given by this complicated function. And indeed, if you work it out, you see this gives just minus 1, which is precisely the multiplier for this group. So you can actually do this for all commuting pairs. And um, you get this uh, theorem that in fact all the functions exist and they have the expected modular properties. There is a, is a unique class that determines the faces. And in fact, many of these vanish by obstructions. And then we have the almost theorem, it's a physics theorem, that for the first 500 coefficients, uh, this decomposition works out. So this is very strong evidence, but we don't know what is the physical interpretation really, because we don't have the orbifold and so on. So our philosophy was to, well, it's similar to what Jeff and others have been working on, and Samir and also uh, the Stanford group, try to find some space-time interpretation of this, taking a slightly different route. Let's look for a space-time interpretation of all these functions. Uh, and this uh, motivates me to go to this second quantization and, and black hole counting. Um, so we take a, slide, a, a step back and we say, okay, suppose we have a Calabi-Yau manifold and we have its elliptic genus. Then we know that this is a weak Jacobi form of weight zero and index equal to this thing. That, so this is what um, Catherine talked about. Now, in this, um, uh, it's another of these uh, magic papers, maybe. Um, Daycraft, Moore, Ferlinde, Ferlinde define Ferlinde defined what they call the second quantized elliptic genus. So what that is, is, is nothing but taking the generating function of elliptic genera of symmetric products of x. And they proved a very nice formula for this. In fact, they gave various uh, expressions. They show that this can be also written as the exponentiated generating function of certain HECA operators acting on the elliptic genus of the original manifold. They also gave an infinite product formula for this generating function. And so here, the HECA operator maps then weak Jacobi forms of weight 0 index m to weak Jacobi forms of weight 0 index m times l. And what appears here are the Fourier coefficients of the original elliptic genus. So for us, the most interesting case is, uh, well, okay, let me first uh, not go to K3, but Gritsenko showed that what you can do is if you take this psi, you take the inverse of this second quantized elliptic genus, and you multiply by a certain factor, then this is a Siegel modular form. The factor AX is, is Gritsenko called this the Hodge anomaly because it only depends on the Hodge numbers of X. Now, what we have here is an example of a multiplicative Borchardt's lift. So Suresh talked about an additive lift this morning. This is what's called a multiplicative lift. So what it is is, is, is a lift from 
modular forms of SL2Z, in this case Jacobi forms, to some automorphic form on SO3,2 or SP4 in this case. Hmm? Not, necessarily. not necessarily. In this case, it is, but not necessarily. Even for ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. For K, no, no, yeah, you're right. This, yeah, that's right. I will later on. I will go, I will relax that. Yeah. Okay. So what about for K3? For K3, it's well known that this procedure gives phi 10, this Agusa, Agusa cusp form, and this is a multiplicative Borchers lift of the K3 elliptic genus. And the key point here is then what Suresh explained this morning and also what Samir touched upon, that the inverse of this is the partition function of quarter BPS dions in heterotic, n equal to 4 heterotic string theory, or type 2 in, on K3 cross T2. So the way this goes is that if you look at these theories, you have a very large moduli space. Uh, <coughs> so you have this space 0, 06, 22, quotiented by the maximum compact subgroup, and you have this discrete duality group that preserves the lattice of, of electric and magnetic charges. And in fact, a full non-perturbative duality group is SL2Z times 06, 22, and the electric magnetic charges transform as a doublet under SL2. So what you have is a decomposition of the Hilbert space into these charged sectors, and, and we know this can be realized as charged black holes. And what we are interested in here are BPS states. So you have one half BPS states, and they are either purely electric or purely magnetic. And you have the generic quarter BPS states, which are dionic, so they have QP non-zero. So we know from um, Atish and Jeff's work that the one half BPS states are counted by this one over eta. 24, and the coefficient here is a number of one-half BPS that we charge Q such that N is equal to Q squared over 2. And what Dekraff and uh, Berlin de Verlinde did is they generalized this. So what is counting quarter BPS states? Well, that should be the sixth helicity supertrace. So this is the, the, the trace over this Hilbert space, and you insert a certain uh, power of the helicity in order to uh, ensure that you get a non-vanishing result for quarter BPS states. Now, in fact, what you know is that this thing must be invariant under the duality group, so it can only depend on the combinations p squared, q squared, and q dot p, which are SO6, 22 invariant combinations, and also it's locally constant on M. In fact, it, has, it exhibits wall-crossing behavior, but it's locally constant on the moduli space. So the connection with what we are interested in follows because from doing a Fourier expansion of 1 over phi 10, and you identify the Fourier coefficients here with this second helicity supertrace. And the coefficients are related to the electric magnetic charges in this way. So this is a long story that is very well understood. And um, an interesting and important fact here is that this has a double pole at z equals 0, and in this limit, you factorize the Siegel modular form, and what you pick up are just the generating functions of the one half BPS states. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, it's double zero, and then you have the inverse, and this is, yeah, sorry, thanks. Um, okay, so this is the sort of how you see the, the, the counting of one half BPS states coming out in, in, in this limit. So this, you can think of this as kind of a wall crossing formula. Now, what we want to do, we want to take inspiration from this. <laughs> and we're going to go to sort of a similar uh, second quantized version of, of Mathieu Moonshine. Now, um, so what we do is we kind of generalize former ideas of, um, so you, <laughs> yes, um, by Miranda and Suresh and so on. So what we do, we define something that we call the second quantized twisted twining genus. So we take all these weak Jacobi forms that we have, which we, we construct the exponentiated generating function of certain HEC operators acting on phi GH. But we cannot just take the same old ordinary HEC operators that we used before, but we have to use the so-called twisted equivariant HEC operators. 
So these have been um, discussed before in the context of generalized uh, moonshine, particularly by Nora Ganter and Scott Carnahan. And, and we need a slightly generalized version of those. Um, and an important point is that this, uh, you can ask if this is a, a well-defined thing. So this depends on the choice of three co-cycle. But if you take different representatives in each class that just amount to a certain uh, re-parameterization of, of, of this sigma by a shift. With respect to uh, SL2Z, I mean, is a, I mean, the combined action of SL2Z and M24. So I, I, will, I will give you explicit formula now. So w w I want to stress that there is a very nice geometric picture of this that is, in fact, quite useful. So Gunter um, had this perspective that you should consider the moduli space of, of, of principal M24 bundles on the elliptic curve determined by, by tau. And so P here is the set of commuting elements of M24. And then you should view these functions as sections of a line bundle over this, an SL2Z equivariant line bundle over this thing. And the main point is that these heck operators, what they do is that they map sections of this bundle to sections of the ELF power bundle. So these sections here, they have a multiplier phase determined by alpha, the co-cycle, that we call chi gh, and these sections have a multiplier phase which has a higher power. But so this, this is quite important because, um, so if you, if you represent, you can represent this action explicitly in this formula. So this is uh, the way it works. It's, it's an action on the phi gh that mixes all of these in this way. You also have to include these multiplier phases. So this is a generalization to Jacobi forms uh, of these former constructions of Gunter. It's also been analyzed a little bit by Tweet and Suresh. So let me give you uh, an example of what this thing could look like. So for, for example, if we take just G and H in, in, uh, in 2B, you can take the second such heck operator, and you, what you get is a sum of three terms. The signs here, they come precisely from the fact that you have included a multiplier system, so that when you, when you put in G and H, then we can calculate this, and we see we have to put these signs here. Hmm? I, that you know better than I do. <laughs> yeah, 12, yeah. <laughs> but here is a very interesting fact that this thing actually vanishes by cohomological obstructions. So you have something that is zero, but in fact its image under the heck operator gives you this object here. Right. Hmm? Because you're, you're acting on the fan. On the yeah, fan yeah, fan. right, exactly, yeah. So but it, you, can, you can think of it here, that you have this, this, this um, fact that you have a map from, these, from L to this power bundle. So for sufficiently large L, you get something that has trivial multiplier phase, and so you kill off the obstructions. So even if you have vanishing twisted twining genera, in fact, all of the second quantized versions are, are, are non-zero. They are unobstructed, in a sense. So in this way, we get a whole family of, of functions constructed in this way. And uh, what we showed is that all of these functions satisfy a number of interesting properties. First of all, they satisfy the, the inverse can be written in terms of this infinite product formula. So it's, uh, it looks, looks a little bit messy. So m and n here are the orders of the element. Lambda here is a number that depends on G. It's the length of the shortest cycle of G. Then the powers here are some numbers that can be explicitly extracted from the Fourier coefficients like, uh, like this, and you need it, it is dressed by the multiplier phase. So in fact, you can do more because you can show that the ratio of a certain function A is a Siegel modular form for some subgroup of SP4R. And this A 
is then sort of a, a generalization of the Hodge anomaly of Gritsenko. And you can write it explicitly in terms of uh, the theta function and eta gh. And eta gh are a certain generalized products of eta functions that were written down by Mason a long time ago in his version of uh, M24 Moonshine. Yes, Asha. Right. And that's also characterized by these two. Right, exactly. Is it the same? Yes, so I will show that this exactly connects to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, that will be the next part. Yeah. Um, and finally, in the limit where z goes to zero, again you have a factorization, and indeed the factorization seems to indicate some kind of counting of one half BPS states in a similar vein as before. We have certain factors entering here, and, and um, so this is a very nice um, generalization of what will happen for phi 10, for instance. So, so that was the case when you actually look at the, you look at the elliptic genus of a Calabi-Yau, and you do this lift, it only depends on the Hodge numbers. So here, I mean, the Hodge anomaly, we just used the same terminology because that's what Grisenko used. So it's, uh, yeah. So, out, so if you ask, okay, how do you show modularity? Well, let me just briefly mention that you can show that um, this thing satisfies a kind of a generalization of electric magnetic duality, which is when you interchange sigma and tau in this way, they are equal, but you get a certain uh, different element here. H prime is not necessarily the same conjugacy class of H. So um, <coughs> this is a, a generalization of what you call electric magnetic duality in the DVV context. Moreover, you can use results of Gritsenko and Nicolin to show that you also have invariance under the paramodular group. So this is what Suresh was talking about this morning. So in fact, Every phi, phi gh is a modular function for some finite index subgroup of a paramodular group gamma t for some t. Now, actually determining which groups you get is, is not uh, easy. But... Hmm? Do you have a nice characterization? Not really. I mean, it's... Uh, oh. Yeah. I mean, for the cases where, I mean, for many cases we can identify with known objects and, you know, that, but in general we, we, we don't know. That's, um, yeah. So, what we, we view this as a, a twisted equivariant version of the multiplicative lift. So, you call this mult, and I put a little g here to indicate that it's kind of an equivariant version because we use this heck operator here rather than the ordinary one. Well, we can show that they, do, they I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, we cannot determine, so we can show, yeah, no, no, we cannot find all the group, yeah, yeah, that's right. So this is, of course, a you know, very important question that we, we can't answer. Um, so let me just briefly summarize what we have. So roughly speaking, we have this kind of triangle of, of objects. Uh, so we have the twisted twining genera, they are weak Jacobi forms. We have a procedure of second quantization or multiplicative lift and that gives us Siegel modular forms. And we have a way to take a limit, a wall crossing inspired limit, and that gives you these eta products. So it connects what Mason did long time ago. He had this proposal for generalized M24 moonshine in terms of these eta products, and this is how they all embed. So this is what Miranda uh, proposed first for the twining genera, and it, it indeed works nicely for this general class of functions. Yes? Yeah, okay, sorry, yes, yeah. All of them? Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. So, so this is kind of a nice, uh, nice complete story, but of course you want to uh, try to now interpret this in, in, in some physical sense. 
So can we interpret this in, in as counting space-time BPS states? Well, the natural thing is to, to start by thinking of uh, the case when G and H are commuting symmetries of some CFT in this context. Well, then what we can do is we can take the orbifold of this theory by G. So this is what uh, Suresh talking about this morning, get the CHL models. And in these models, we have, we can count twisted down states where you have this kind of uh, twisted entwined index that has been analyzed, particularly by Ashok, and computed for, for us in, in many cases by a whole list of, of people. Probably there are more in this list. And so the natural question is, does this have anything to do with the functions that we find? So if we expand the second quantized twisted twining genus, we get some Fourier coefficients like this. And indeed, for some pairs of elements, this indeed coincides with the Fourier coefficients of phi gh. So it gives a way of connecting these uh, Siegel modular forms to the counting of twisted VPS states in CHL models. So it's, it's natural to ask, you know, is, is it possible that all of these have some interpretation in some generalized CHL story, and, and that we cannot quite answer at the moment, but it certainly looks uh, like it, it fits. But now you mean inverse. Yes, yes, I mean inverse. Yes, yes, I, I mean inverse. <laughs> inverse, inverse, I mean in, in this sense. Is there, a no, is there a mathematical relation known for the inverse function? A mathematical relation in, in what's that? What do you Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You mean if this whole thing holds for sort of the, uh, yeah. You're saying that the, the physics, the relation with Dios and, and the nice mathematical mm -hmm. relation that you found holds for, not for the same function. But right, but yeah, so the way we do, we first analyze the phi GH, and then we identify it with certain known functions that we know the inverse of that mm -hmm. it works in the CHL story. Yeah. Yes? Yes, yeah, so I will come to that. I will come to examples. Yeah, exactly. So I will come to examples, and I want to c connect that to the umbral story. Uh, yeah. I think uh, there is evidence from the events of the Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 But, but for all elements of GH, I mean, uh, we, we don't have a good physical model for, for any GH, right? I mean, no, I mean, the thing is in the counting, for instance, just if you let, let's look at the Siga product case. Yes. And in the Siga part, nothing happens there. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that I'm, I'm, yeah, well, we certainly hope it, but I... I mean, the hard anomaly... Yeah, yeah. Exactly those two things. Yeah, yeah, right. It's always but, times, uh, but you don't always have a CHL model uh, uh, realizing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. I mean, I agree. Yes, I'm just saying it's not... Yeah. But here, yeah, but here we f have, have groups that they fall outside of that. And, and the question is, can you, interp can you interpret that? Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. So that's, what we, so that's why we, we, we hope that there is some interpretation, but yeah. Uh, but so I want to pr give some more examples, and I want to do it uh, because this is a moonshine conference. I want to give some examples um, in the context of, uh, of umbral moonshine. 
<laughs> I'm just reinterpreting the name of your moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to rewrite it. Um, no, but so um, t taking a step back, I mean, if you, if you remember, um, what was the motivation for generalized monstrous moonshine? Well, it was the fact that there was a lot of numerical evidence that there was moonshine for many, many more groups than just a monster. In particular, there's this uh, paper by Queen where she gives uh, evidence for moonshine uh, for many groups, and all of which are centralizers of elements of the monster. So Norton basically took that, and that was you know, the way he sort of combined all of those into generalized monstrous moonshine. So you know, it's a little bit natural to think maybe umbral moonshine uh, can be in a similar way understood, or part of it understood, within generalized M24 moonshine. Now, it looks like it doesn't work quite like that, but there is some, some indication that, 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 that there is um, a similar kind of thing happening. So let me just briefly remind you that what uh, Jeff and Miranda John did, they proposed a generalization involving, uh, well, now there are 23 examples labeled by these ADE root systems. So let's focus on the six cases which are pure A-type root system. So they are labeled by a, a group and uh, a weak Jacobi form. Uh, L is called so-called lambency. And uh, so uh, L minus 1 gives the index of this Jacobi form. Um, and of course the Mathieu moonshine corresponds to the first case, L equal 2, when this group is M24 and Z is the elliptic genus of K3. So what we want to see now is that there is some relation between the rest of the groups and, and generalized um, M24 moonshine. So let's consider an example where you take both G and H are in 2A. Then we know that this is obstructed. But in fact, this thing is a weak Jacobi form of weight 0 and index 2. And this is nothing but the umbral Jacobi form for lambency 3. And in fact, you can, you can observe this for more examples. So for 3A, 3A, you get the umbral Jacobi form of index uh, of, of lambency 4. And for 4B, 4B, you get the umbral Jacobi form of lambency 5. Yes, exactly. So that will come, uh, yeah. So that's quite intriguing. But of course, it's, you know, it's a HEC operator acting on this is the umbral Jacobi form. So the question is, can you connect it a little bit more to this counting of states and so on? Well, what you can do is, so in fact, um, what, what Jeff and friends did, they also constructed a certain Borchardt's lift of this. So you take now the ordinary Borchardt's lift, not the equivariant version, but you just take the mult of this weak Jacobi form. Well, then that's given by a certain infinite product where this AL, BL, CL are, are known numbers. And in particular, for L equal 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, they observe that this phi L is in fact delta K squared. K is related to L in this way, and K are certain weight K Siegel modular forms that were constructed before by Gritsenko and Nicolin. And what we find is that these Siegel modular forms in fact coincide with the corresponding second quantized twisted winding genera. So on the left hand side, we have conjugacy classes in M24. On the right hand side, we have these umbral Siegel modular forms. So there is this, somehow this overlap for some of the, of the group elements. And in fact, this, this identification is quite non-trivial because uh, what we have is on the right hand side, we just have an ordinary multiplicative lift of a weak Jacobi form. But on the left hand side, we have an equivariant lift of this phi GH. And a priori, to us, it doesn't seem obvious that the two should, uh, should be related. But it seems that for each G and H, is in these cases, you can have a realization in terms of an ordinary Borchardt lift. And these are indeed the same Siegel and forms that appear in CHL models, and Suresh was talking about them this morning. And you can also show that 
and this is also um, following some, some observation by Suresh, that if you actually take the additive lifts of these Hodge anomalies in this case, you get precisely uh, these Siegel Bonnelaar forms. No, 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 not no. It's just that these are the cases. Uh, yeah, that's right. So there is there are some more cases, but I mean they're not. Um, so for instance, there is this. Uh, what is it? Two uh, A two B, for instance, that gives you the so-called the function called Q one, and that also appears in the CHL model. And so I don't think that that's. Um, it's just that it also works when they're obstructed. Right, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. We, 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 I mean, uh, we were very inspired by what Scott did. So, so Scott showed that, you know, in order to, 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 to construct this generalized moonshine, he had to use this, this, this um, equivariant heck operator. So we thought, okay, we try the same thing, adapt it to our setting, and, and we just end up here. So... I don't know, do you have some, some insight there, Roberto? Uh, I mean, they, they, they happen to be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Can, I mean, I don't know if there is any implication, but you can cite the <coughs> something easy to cite. Yeah, I don't see. Yeah. <coughs> What did you say? It doesn't. Q1. Yes. Yes. That also fits. Yes. The two. Yes. Yes. Uh, no, that's no. So that we don't. Uh, no, I don't think that's related to umbral moonshine. But that is one of. It's also occurs in CHL models, and it's part of our story. So. Yeah, I think the, the, I mean, the connect, I mean, what natural thing to, to do is to try now to consider, okay, what about the, the twining versions of the umbral, I mean, for each of these groups, and you can do a lot of things, so. Right, exactly, so these are, yeah, so they just happen to be, uh, I mean, if you take this uh, Hecke action, it turns out that they are also, you know, under the full modular group, which in general would not be true. So there's some special thing happening for these ones. So I think a yeah, natural question is, you know, is this somehow just because modularity is very constraining, or is it, is it there's there some deeper relation? And, and I'm pretty sure there is some relation, and it connects to CHL models and so on. But I, the picture is not uh, clear. Okay, so let me just end with some uh, summary and a little bit of open questions. Um, well, so I think what we have is, uh, is more or less an established generalized material moonshine, at least from a physics perspective. We have all these twisted twining genera. We know that they can be expanded. It all seems to fit with M24. Moreover, the, the second quantized version are Siegel modular forms, and we see that many of them actually coincide with what's known for CHL models and they somehow connect with umbral moonshine. Now, um, to very natural question is then, what about the BKM underlying these? So from generalized monstrous moonshine, what you would expect is that for each conjugacy class, there is a generalized Katsumudi algebra such that uh, these objects uh, that you obtain by lifting the, the twisted twining genera would be associated to denominator formulas. Now, for some cases, the cases I've shown, this, this, there are BKMs, but associated to the square root of these objects. And we just don't know how they actually connect to M24. Now, one ingredient that you would like to have is, is so what about the, is there some equivariant version of the additive lift that you would put on the other side? 
And so uh, Iguchi and Hikami have studied some, some uh, very additive lifts before, and we're not entirely sure how it relates. But certainly, there, it seems that there should be such a thing. Now, the fact that you have BKMs underlying this naturally also raises the question of, of VPS algebras. I mean, in, in, in I think your second paper, you conjecture that for n equal to 4 theories, the full non-perturbative BPS algebra would be a BKM. I mean, that's, that seems very natural, but to actually construct an action of the monster on these things, it seems very hard. Um, well, you, you, know, you would like to have, maybe understand if there is a generalized version of umbral moonshine where, you know, you can look at the third cohomology of all these groups and see if you can constrain the faces in the same way. And, and then the, this, this kind of thing also that hasn't been so prominent in, in this, this week, but it's very interesting, these other connections uh, to n equal 2 and n equal 1 versions of Mathieu moonshine that also has this space-time interpretation. And, um, and that also suggests some role for, for N24 in mirror symmetry. And in particular, if you think in terms of what Catherine was talking about, suppose you have this chiral drawn complex and that actually works. You can, you know, you can construct an action of N24 on the cohomology. Now, that should be viewed in some sense as, the, as related to the topological A model. So there is a mirror version of that. So you can ask what does M24 have to do with in, in that context of mirror symmetry. So there are many of these interesting questions. Uh, but so the main one is still there. We don't know what it acts on. It really looks like there is some chiral holomorphic vertex algebra is there, but we just don't know what it is. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, Suresh. Sorry? There. Uh huh. Then I would expect that the that the the rate of the model form will be negative. Yes. Yes. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's meromorphic. I don't know. I I don't think it's a it's a problem, but. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. is there a relationship? Is there a relationship between the group, uh, the m equals four group of umbral moonshine, and, and the centralizer? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I think the umbral group is just a little bit bigger than the centralizer in that case, There's right? Some sense of yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Ah. I see. No, we haven't. But yes, yeah, so in fact, the relation you wrote down looked very much like some kind of equivariant Heck exactly. operator. And, and so that, that's right. Maybe there's a way. To right, through some kind of Heck operator. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. We haven't tried. I mean, somehow I think when you wrote it down, that seemed very similar, but uh, we haven't tried it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, so I think we should also, I mean, uh, Samir already thanked uh, Sujay, but I think we should all thank, you know, Sujay and Samir for this amazing, uh, amazing week. So thanks a lot. So 2018, Sujay has promised that the blue mountains will bloom, and he promised, Jeff, I was the witness, there will be a new <laughs> conference. <laughs> uh -uh.